case review class 2 composite restoration the biomimetic approach we want to thank our sponsors Coltine, uh for being so generous with uh with us uh in the past i would say 4 to 5 years they have supported uh all of our ventures in this um in this youtube channel so we really want to thank them and we want uh, all our followers to know that they, they thanks to their support all these clinical case reviews and webinars are completely free i also want to mention our newest uh live hands-on course that will be held in atlanta georgia we have two dates friday april 26 which we are feeling actively and saturday april 27th of this year 2024 like i said in atlanta georgia our topic will be the imperceptible aesthetic restoration a direct composite hands-on experience and you will obtain nine ce credits to attend this live seminar hands-on seminar six of these ce credits will be uh, for the hands-on and only three would be the lecture so it is it's, it's going to be a very intense very um, a high quality uh, hands-on experience for all the participants. So please make sure that you visit our webpage, www.romerodentalseminars.com and search and you know look for our hands-on. You can go to the uh, live uh, seminars link and you will be able to uh, access this page right here and go ahead and make your payment directly through our webpage. Uh, so we hope to see everyone there in April. Please don't forget to subscribe early since spots are limited. Another thing that we want to ask for you is that you visit our YouTube channel and you subscribe to our channel. We are up to 107 videos with this video that's being recorded now. Um, and uh, there's a lot of content, a lot of good information in our channel. If you are already a subscriber, please share it with uh, other colleagues. And if you haven't subscribed, just hit that little bell so that you can get instant messaging every time we upload a new video. So again, let's go into our topic today. Uh, I am going to share with you a, a, a clinical case where the, pa the patient presented with secondary caries underneath an existing composite restoration. And just to give you an idea of what of what you know what what this looked like initially uh, from a clinical standpoint i want you to look at teeth number 12 and 13 you can see that both of them have very large and deep uh, caries that compromise the inner proximal uh, of, of walls of these teeth now we initially restored tooth number 13 tooth number 12 i'm sorry and then we brought the patient back for tooth number 13 today we're going to share with you how we went uh, you know how do we uh, recommend going through the process of not only eliminating the previous restoration and the caries that is present, but also just going through the process of how to create the strongest bond possible prior to you layering your composite and finish finishing this composite restoration. On the left-hand side, you can see the initial clinical situation. On the right-hand side, on both on teeth 12 and 13, you can see the completed uh, case with you know good and sealed and well adapted you know proximal surface for both of these teeth. I do want to mention that in regards to the, some of the steps or techniques that I'm going to share with you today, uh, these have been uh, taught to me by Dr. David Aleman. You can see here in the photo, David is um, um, the one to my left or right side of the photo. Davy, his son, who is also one of my mentors in the areas of biomedic dentistry, is on the left side of the photo, right side of me. And Dr. Wold, it's towards the far right of the photo. All of them, again, I, I respect them tremendously, and I want to give them credit for some, you know, some of the information that I'm going to share today, which I know it's been valuable for my career, and I hope that it's also valuable for what you're doing in your clinical practice today. So the first thing that we want to talk about is caries removal endpoint and i want you to really understand this word uh because you know every single letter that you see on that one on, on, on these word on this sentence is very important you know we we have you can see on the left hand side the photo with the secondary decay you can see a failing composite restoration and this composite restoration has been there just for a couple of years and you want to ask yourself you know why is this restoration failing you know can it be that you know the restoration 
uh, you know, wasn't bonded uh, ideally, or the or, or the carries on this cavity wasn't managed correctly. You know, these are these are good reasons why a restoration, any type of restoration, even a composite restoration, can could start failing. So when we're talking about you know carries removal endpoint, what we're trying to say is really, uh, you know, removing the the decay in the in in specific areas of the dentin that would that would uh, create a better seal of our restoration to the underlying substrate. That's really what caries endpoint means. Now it also means that when you are removing caries, you're gonna to have to be careful with, some, with certain areas, right? Specifically with the deeper areas, right? You know, either the purple floor or the actual wall, because you know that the pulp chamber lies right underneath them. And the deeper the cavity, the closer you are going to be to this pulp chamber. The younger the patient, the larger the pulp chamber. So all these things you really have to you know, they have to come into play. You have to try to understand them as best as you can. And there's a really nice article out there written by Dr. Aleman about caries removal endpoint and, you know, how to obtain a peripheral seal zone, which is really the ultimate goal of caries removal endpoint, right? You know, cleaning that dentin so that you have you know, so that you have a, a good surface to bond to. Now, keep in mind that bonding to a very nice and clean and tubular dentin with a lot of collagen fibers is not the same as trying to bond to deeper uh, uh, dentin where you have some, um, you know, affected or infected dentin that definitely has been, you know, has lost some of the collagen, has lost some of its tubular uh, anatomy. And for sure, the, the, the strength of bond in that area is never going to be the same as that, as the, as the cleaner, more, more tubular, more uh, collagen uh, rich uh, dentin. So, that is what Dr. Um, Aleman calls, you know, hierarchy of bondability, because depending on the type of tissue or the type of dentin that you're going to be bonding to, that bond strength is going to be dependent directly onto, onto that characteristic. So just to keep, you know, just to give you a couple of pointers and what you're seeing on this photo on the right hand side is me applying the, the, the caries detection dye. And caries detection dye becomes very important from a clinical standpoint. And I use it, you know, today I use it every single day because def it definitely opens your eyes and it makes you understand in a more histological way what kind of tissue, what kind of dentin you're really dealing with. You know, it's not enough uh, to, to just use the explorer or a spoon excavator because, you know, m research has shown that it's, that it's not that reliable. That is not enough for you to say, oh, I feel this dentin, you know, being hard enough, and 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 should that dentin be really free of caries? And mainly in the in the critical areas, like I said, the peripheral zone, that that uh, you know, closer to the DJ, or I would say, uh, you know, two millimeters from the DJ, you know, in a circumference around the the the, the infected dentin, you know, those are areas that you really want to have very nice and clean dentin that you really want to make the effort to remove all the caries that you can. And the only way of identifying that, that, uh, identifying that caries dentin and making sure that you've eliminated it completely is by using a very simple technique described many, many years ago by Dr. Fusoyama, what, uh, that, that it really in, in, in enables you to, again, visualize this, th these different layers uh, of caries. Because as you know, there are two layers of caries that have been identified and recognized, which is the outer and the inner caries layers. Now that outer caries layer is, is where more that infected dentin is, that dentin has lost all the collagen and, and all this is tubular uh, um, histo you know, or microanatomy. So this dentin, even when you're trying to remove that, that very superficial soft dentin, you know, you probably don't even need to numb the patient because it has been shown that when removing that type of dentin, it, there is no sensation on the tooth because the dentin is really not doing anything else and it's just necrotic dentin. Now, under, underneath that dentin, that now you have a different layer of dentin that is a little bit less um, demineralized and it's more, um, I would say, uh, affected dentin. So it's, it's more mineralized and it's a dentin that you can bond to. Now, when you use this caries detection dye, there's two layers uh, 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 of stains that you're going to be able to accomplish, right? You're going to see a very red, intense red layer. And underneath that red layer, once you start removing that outer caries dentin, the inner caries dentin actually stains more or rather pink. Now, that inner caries dentin is the one that you can actually bond to. Now, you're not going to get as good as a bond in that inner caries dentin as you would get in the peripheral, nice, clean peripheral seal zone. But 
it, it, you're going to get, um, you know, you, 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 we already know that we're not going to get as good of a bond, but you're going to get much better bond than you would to infect the dent. And now in some cases, again, depending on the depth of your preparation, you're probably going to have to leave more of that outer carries uh, or that transition between the outer and the inner carries dentin uh, underlying your restoration. And that, again, is because the ultimate goal of biomedic dentistry is to keep the tooth vital. If the tooth re has a normal response to cold stimuli before you start preparing the cavity, your goal, your ultimate goal is to keep that tooth vital. And that being said, you want to try to prevent as much as you can uh, you know, to create a pulp exposure. Now, if you create a pulp exposure, there are some techniques that Dr. Aleman and others recommend so for you to, um, you know, to just uh, go ahead and do a direct pulp cap. We're not going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk about trying to be as conservative as possible at the moment that you are removing the dentin. Try to try to identify and recognize these inner and outer uh, uh, caries dentin, trying to measure from the cusp to the actual bottom of your preparation and try to be in that four to five millimeter limit in depth so that you know that you're going to be on the safe zone of being away from that pulp chamber. And again, once you stain the tooth with this, uh, with this uh, caries detection dye, you want to make sure that you remove the red uh, uh, if there is no pulp exposure, as I just mentioned a, a couple of minutes ago, and leave the pink. You want to leave the pink because now we know that that inner carries dentin, who at the same time has three very distinct layers, is one that we can bond to and that we can probably accomplish maybe a third of 30 megapascal bond strength to it uh, compared to maybe 50 that you can get to the peripheral seal zone. So that's that's showing you right there that you're going to have differences in bond strength. But again, you want to try to accomplish, and that's why you want to try to accomplish as much as you can, that nice, clean peripheral seal zone, nice, clean dentin all around, two millimeters from the DJ, so that you can rely on your bonding to that area. Uh, and that's that's critical when it comes, again, down to adhesive dentistry. Because, you know, your your restoration is going to be dependent on that bond strength that you are creating, a, a, again, on that dentin. This is the critical aspect. We already know that we're going to be able to accomplish, you know, good bonding to our enamel. But it's the bonding to the dentin that is so critical. And it's the bonding to the dentin where many of us just simply think that we're going to use either a total edge technique or a selective edge technique, apply the adhesive, and by miracles, you're just going to layer, you know, one to two millimeters or two millimeter thickness layers of composite, and you think that everything is going to be okay. And I'm going to show you today in this, with this clinical case, that, you know, that that is not really the way that we should be thinking, because that's not correct. We want to layer, we want to take our time, we want to do very thin layers, and I'll show you why. But this graph right here on the right-hand side comes directly from the article written by Dr. Aleman about, uh, you know, caries endpoint removal. And as you can see, he is showing the outer caries dentin and the inner caries dentin and the three layers of inner caries dentin, the two, the turbid layer, the transparent zone, and the subtransparent zone. Um, and, and those are the ones, again, that we want to keep because as you can see on that graph on the right-hand side, that, that is the deeper, the, the, the deeper dentin or the deepest portion of the dentin where you are at this point, you are maybe, you know, five millimeters away from that cusp. As you can see that they're measuring there using those two periodontal probes. And you want to make sure that you don't go beyond that point because now you're risking or you have a higher risk of um, exposing that pulp chamber or, you know, either a, a pulp horn or, or getting into the pulp chamber. So it, you're seeing on the right hand side, I've removed my, uh, my red dye my caries detection dye, and you can see a little bit of pink on the deep areas of the purple floor and a little bit on the actual wall. That pink right there is telling me I'm done with my caries removal. I still have some pink, and if you see up here, uh, you know, closer to the DEJ, I want to be two millimeters of the DEJ all around this preparation, and I want to have no stain. That's going to be my peripheral seal zone. You can see that I still have some stained pink here, some stained pink here, a little bit in this area. And in the deep area, also I have pink. I'm not going to touch that deep area anymore because I know at this point that I'm closer to the pulp chamber, higher risk of, 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 
of again exposing the pulp. What I do want is still go ahead with a small, maybe 1.5 or 2 millimeter diamond round burr. Just go around this area and remove more of that pink until I get to something like what you see here. You see on the left hand side, I've been able to remove more of that pink. I have a much cleaner area, no pink, 2 millimeters with it you know within the that dej all around my cavity what you see here in orange on the right hand side is exactly that same photo with my uh, my um garrison matrix in place and the band but that that orange zone is what we call the peripheral seal zone that's the area when i'm going to get my best bond to that dentin and in the center where i've left that window is where you can see a little bit of the pink right on top of that inner carries dentin which i am going to get bond but i'm going to get less bond strength and this is now why the next step is also very important now in this particular case i'm going to restore this case using a direct composite resin if i were to restore this case using an indirect restoration like an onlay um, uh, you know, if I had if I had any cracks or for whatever reason I decided that this tooth needed an only, I would not be etching the enamel at this point. I would just be concentrating on working on the dentin. Again, because my goal right now is not to connect the dentin layers with the enamel, because as we know, enamel bond strength is going to be higher. So I'm going to create a lot of tension in those areas, a lot of stress within my composite layers. So the only reason why you see that I'm selectively etching my enamel is because my final layer will be with composite and I will place adhesive on that enamel once I finish uh, you know, creating my my uh, my adhesive layer within the dentin so that's the reason why you see that first that 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 you know selective etching on the left hand side i know many dentists that wait to do their selective etching or they don't do any selective etching and then just use their self etching potential uh that comes within their uh um adhesive systems i Personally, don't like doing that. I don't like relying on my self-etching adhesive system because I know that the best etching that you can get, and there's a lot of studies to show that, is going to be with phosphoric acid on the enamel. So for that reason, I always etch. I selectively etch my enamel. I do it for 15 to 20 seconds. I rinse, I dry, and then I have what you see on the photo on the right-hand side where I'm going to concentrate on placing my primer and my adhesive only on the dentin at this point. I'm not going to connect my dentin with my enamel. Now, when I'm applying that uh, that adhesive, the question is what kind of adhesive am I going to use? Because I have not etched the dentin with phosphoric acid, I need to move forward using a self-etching adhesive. And personally, and for this type of techniques, uh, it is recommended for you to use a two-bottle system. And the two-bottle system gives you much more control. You have the control of placing your primer and the control of placing your adhesive. You have the control of placing your primer for 20 to 30 seconds. That is kind of like the dual time. And then using the air water syringe to eliminate the solvent. Don't forget that if you leave solvent within that hybrid layer, that solvent is going to create contamination of that area. And it's also going to... Um, um, you know, um, um, stimulate the formation of MMPs. And as you know, those are going to degrade your hybrid layer, uh, uh, you know, in the next coming months. So that's something that you don't want to, you, you want to try to prevent. And the best way of doing that is by having these two bottle systems where you have complete control of each and every one of those steps. So what you see on the right-hand side is that we have placed that primer first, and I'll show you which is the adhesive that I normally use for this type of techniques. I place my primer. I have a dwell time of 20 to 30 seconds. That means that I apply it multiple times and I'm scrubbing that dentin to get that primer to really infiltrate within the dentin. I then eliminate the excess initially using my micro brush and drying the micro brush on a paper towel. And then I'm going to use my air water syringe. I use a, a, a air water syringe tip that really blocks any water from coming out. This is a system made by Kerr, and I use that system so that I don't have any water contamination when I'm blowing air out of my air water syringe, and I'm now blowing air to that, to that primer layer so that I can eliminate the solvent. And I do it for maybe 10 to 15 seconds, and you, you, will, you will smell 
you know, the, the alcohol coming out, the, the, the solvent coming out of that primer. And now once you see it nice and dry, you don't see any liquid moving within that dentin, then the second steps come and I'll show you what that second step will look like. But the most important thing is which type of adhesive system do you use? This is the one that I use. This is the one that I would recommend. This is OptiBond Extra Universal by Kerr. I like the OptiBond family. There's a lot of research. I mean, I, you know, I think that it's still the best bonding agent out there and the gold standard everybody wants to compare with is OptiBond FL. Well, this is, I would say, a, 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 a relative of OptiBond FL called OptiBond Extra Universal. So uh, again, you have your acidic primer on, on one bottle uh, where you have the solvent, where you have the acidic monomer also so that you can superficially etch that dentin and eliminate some of that um, smear layer. And then on your second bottle, you have your adhesive. And you have, you know, not a really thick adhesive. This is more on the thinner side compared to OptiBond FL, but it still is a filled adhesive that you can place and you can create, you know, a, a decent thickness of, uh, of a hybrid layer that would allow you even to use it with indirect restorations. And I use this all the time. And this is the only adhesive that I use in my office for direct or indirect uh, type of, uh, of, of dental procedures. So once I put my adhesive, then, you know, it, uh, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to light cure. Again, don't forget, I've only placed the primer and the adhesive on my dent and I have not placed any adhesive on the enamel yet i don't want to try i don't want to connect them yet you can see now that i've used um, i'm creating what, what has been called the resin coating layer and this resin coating layer has a very important function it has a function of creating a more thicker hybrid layer but most importantly because it is a flowable composite that is only filled in this particular case uh you know 60 to 70 percent I use Brilliant Everglow Flow to create this resin coating layer. And what I like about it is that you can see here on a micro uh, CT uh, um, interface, you can see that um, there, th the way that this uh, flowable composite adapts to any cavity walls, regular or uniform or irregular, is very nice because its wettability, it's very, uh, it, or its flowability, as you can see on the upper chart, is, or, you know, it's not, it's not really runny but it's not consistent either. It's, it's, it doesn't stay in one place. It flows nicely around the cavity and, uh, and it's a very, you know, I, there's a very thin, thin tip that actually comes with this flowable composite. So it's very easy to apply specifically where you want to apply it. But at the same time, it has good flowability, good enough flowability that it stays exactly where you place it. You can see that I've placed this layer only on the dentin. I've stayed away from the enamel on the floor of my box completely. And I was able to do that because this flowable composite, you know, it has good memory and it stays, even though it flows nicely, it stays exactly where you want to apply. Once I wet the dentin with a very thin layer, and I would say less than half of a millimeter, no more than one millimeter, you always want to be less than a millimeter. And how do I know that? I use a periodontal probe actually to spread this very thin layer of, uh, of, of, um, a flowable resin in that dentin. And I just wet all the dentin walls, the floor, the actual wall, and the gingival floor. All that, as you can see, is wet with a thin layer, I would say half of a millimeter thick of this flowable composite, and then I light cure. And with this, I've created that resin coating layer. I have now completed all the steps needed to obtain a really strong hybrid layer. But there's one more thing that you need to understand. And this is one thing that is, honestly, is against the way that many people practice today. You know, when you're practicing in environments that you're seeing one patient every 30 minutes, you really don't have time to this, for this type of dentistry. So this type of dentistry, you know, you, you have to understand that it's going to take longer. I like to call it, you know, slow dentistry. But slow dentistry it equals, in my mind, to good dentistry. So one of the things that I like to do that I want to explain to you here, and, I, and you can read it from this article written also by Dr. Aleman and, and others, uh, is about, you know, talking about decoupling time. And what does decoupling time refer to? And I'm going to read it directly out of their article because I don't want you to think that I'm trying to convince you this is the way that I do it. If I only have one tooth to restore, I go ahead and I just put a timer and I wait for four minutes. 
So I'm not going to do anything on that resin coating layer. I'm not going to apply any more composite until four minutes go by. And I, and I actually have a timer in my office and I have my assistant turn on that timer and I don't move forward until um, that timer starts, you know, the bell rings on the timer. But again, I'm going to read it directly from the first paragraph of, of, of this article. It says, having small volumes, this is the conclusions of the article, having small volumes of composite move toward the dentin hybrid layer as a cure is a primary goal of biomimetic restorative dentistry. And I want to repeat that. This is saying that your primary goal is that the first layer of, of composite that you're applying to the tooth need to move towards, the, towards that bonded or adhesive wall. So they need to move or cure towards that layer, towards that dentin layer. And the only way that you can do that is, again, applying very thin layers. And that first layer, as I said, as I mentioned, was only a half of a millimeter layer of a very flowable composite. Then it says, this ensures that large layers of composite that are thicker than one millimeters are not connected to the developing hybrid layer during at least the first five minutes of its polymerization reaction. So what, it, what they're trying to say there is that we, we have to allow this layer to mature for five minutes because it has been proven by research that in those first five minutes, 90 to 95 percent of this resin has completely polymerized and it's when its bond strength is stronger has gotten all the, all, all the way up to maybe i would say 45 to very close to 50 megapascals so now you know that you have a really good and strong bond now the subsequent layers that i'm going to place i still going to have to manage their thicknesses because again the thicker the layer and even more when i get to the enamel once I apply adhesive to the enamel and I start placing my final layers towards the enamel, I got to make sure that I control that polymerization stress, which is also known as C-factor. Because again, you know, the, once I start building this composite up, there's so many walls that are going to be pulling that, that, that resin. So the thicker the layers, the more stress you're going to be able to build up. But this step is the most important one. This resin coating layer, I allow it to sit there for four minutes before I start working on my subsequent layers. Now at this point that I'm done allowing some maturation of that resin coating or that hybrid layer, what is my next step? My next step is gonna to be to apply adhesive to my enamel. Remember, I didn't apply any adhesive to the enamel that had been etched already. I've been selectively etched. So now I'm gonna apply the adhesive to the enamel and I'm gonna light cure that adhesive. And now I'm gonna start bonding my proximal wall first. Again, I'm thinking about C factor. I want to make sure that I have the ratio of bonded and unbonded walls is, is at least equal. I don't want more bonded walls than unbonded walls because we all know that that's going to create some problems. So as you can see here, I'm, I'm using a centripetal technique first. So I'm only building that proximal wall. If you look at that proximal wall, unbonded walls of that proximal wall is the one that's looking towards the actual wall the one that's looking towards the distal wall of the of, uh, of the adjacent premotor the one that's looking towards the occlusal or, or the marginal ridge area those are your unbonded walls and you can see these are big walls and your bonded walls are your buccal margin your lingual margin and your gingival floor so there's a lot less surface on the bonded walls than free surfaces on your unbonded walls that's a positive C factor. We're going to get stress being um, uh, dissipated through those non-bonded walls. My next step, and let me go back, sorry. My next step, if you see on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side, I have now placed my first horizontal layer of dentin. That first horizontal layer of dentin, you want to try to keep them less than one millimeter. And again, you can use your probe to kind of measure where is that millimeter and then apply your layer. So you want to keep it very nice and smooth, very nice and thin layers of composite. And I may do one or two of these and I just do them horizontally, just like what you're seeing on the right hand side. And then continuing to benefit my restoration from the C factor, I'm going to do then what is what has been called the successive cusp buildup technique. So I started with a centripetal technique to build the proximal wall. Then I did a couple of horizontal layers on the dentin floor of this preparation. And then finally, my final enamel layers are gonna be a centripetal technique where I'm building the lingual cusp first. And then you can see on the right-hand side, I've built the buccal cusp. 
and now I have something that looks like a tooth that recreates the anatomy of this tooth. All I have to do now is eliminate any excess and make sure that I can adjust the occlusion and polish the restoration. So, you know, the final result should be a good final result, should be a tooth or a restoration that looks like a tooth, that mimics a tooth. You want to have a good interproximal contact to prevent any food from getting caught there. But most importantly, what is the main or the most important aspect of this presentation has been creating that hybrid layer, that really strong bond to that peripheral seal zone, to that inner caries dentin. Now you understand that using that detection dye is going to open your eyes and it's going to make you see more than feel anything. And it's going to make you see that difference in color, red and pink, as Dr. Aleman says. You want to differentiate that. You know that you can leave some pink. You want to always try to remove the red. But if re by removing the red in that central zone or deep areas of your dentin may risk by any means getting into the pulp, you're going to stop and you're going to incorporate that infected dentin also into your hyperlayer. You're probably going to get less bond strength. You are going to get, not probably, you are going to get less bond strength there, but you're going to rely on your peripheral seal zone. Those are two millimeters at least within the DJ all around your preparation. So you have that nice and clean dentin, and that clean dentin is the one that you're going to be relying on, to, on obtaining that really bond strength in your hyperlayer. And finally, don't forget to wait those four minutes allow that decoupling time to actually, uh, you know, go through before you move forward to doing your successive uh, cusp buildup or your centripetal technique or your horizontal layer, depending on the technique that you like to use. I just shared with you a combination of all three of them. And, and again, as you saw, the results, you know, were, were good results based out of this technique. But most importantly, I know that if my restoration, for whatever reason, ever fails, my hyper layer, my, the, the, this tooth is now protected. The dentin underneath that, that, uh, that composite is protected because it's a very, very well bonded. I want to thank all our followers for watching uh, the, our first webinar of 2024. And I hope that you enjoy this case review. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask on our YouTube channel. I normally reply to questions in 24 to 48 hours. And, uh, and, and thank you again for being with us today. Have a great rest of your weekend.